What do you think of the relevance of Karl Marx's work in today's world? Well, I think he's become more relevant in recent years. The, the big event in the West was the 2008 financial crisis. And that really broke the idea that the economy was working. It, it clearly was not working. And Marx, of course, throughout his life, he emphasized that capitalism was not a smooth system. It would be subject to periodic crises. And so when the 2008 financial crisis happened, people said, oh, Marx was right. Things are not going to work. And I think that's uh, reinvigorated people's interest in him. Before, particularly with the fall of the Soviet Union, people said, oh, well, you know, he's gone, he's finished, it's all finished now. But now he's a very contemporary figure. The other thing that's happened, of course, is that since that crisis, you've seen a huge uh, increase in levels of inequality. You see that across the Western world, mm -hmm. that the, the difference between the rich and the poor is getting bigger and bigger every day. So in a way, we've gone backwards to a situation Marx would know very well from the 19th century. So the, the landscape of capitalism now, although you have high-speed train and computer, yes. the social landscape is very, very similar to the one he described. That's really uh, incredible, I mean, to think about that, that uh, although we have developed so much ahead, what he was describing is still relevant, but was what he proposed can still answer the questions for today? Can his theories still provide answers for the question, you, for pro the problem you just my, mentioned? My own view is that, that his theories are a necessary starting point, but he died in 1883, so he couldn't answer all of the questions that we have what to. What is the starting point, for the, instance? The, well, the starting point is that we still, in the West, we still live in a capitalist society. And I, from, I think his analysis of capitalism is still the most uh, solid and the most convincing. So as, as long as we have a capitalist society, I think we need to start with his fundamental perceptions, which were firstly that it's a society of exploitation, that the rich will try to take everything they can and run away, um, and that it's a society that will always have crises and will manufacture inequalities. All of those characteristics are now very, very familiar to us in the current situation across Europe. It, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a fundamental crisis of the whole system. Let's so he's, he's, a, he's a man who understood crisis. Let's talk about the situation in China. Is Marxism um, still the relevant um, theoretical framework to guide China's development in the future or do you think new ideas need to be drawn in to re reinforce that? You, you certainly need some new ideas but I think he still is relevant because you, you, when you had a revolution you, you didn't have a capitalist society. I mean the, the revolution entered a society that was much less developed. Now you are creating your own form of capitalism, you know, capitalism with Chinese characteristics. Instead of socialism um, with... <laughs> it, well, I mean, it it's, it's also has socialism with Chinese characteristics, but I think you've moved now much more towards a, a capitalist system with markets and, and, and profit generation and so on. And as soon as you do that, then I think Marx becomes more relevant because that's the society analyst. He was never a, an analyst of communism. You know, the Communist Manifesto was not a manifesto for a communist party. There was no communist party until Marx, after Marx died. It's a manifesto for a vision of a society that would have a solidarity, would have common ownership of property, and where people would not exploit each other. Um, that was what he wanted, that's what he dreamed of, but he never lived to see that. Mm -hmm. But what he did was to produce a very fundamental analysis of the society he saw all around him. So as, as long as you have any elements of capitalism in a society, Marx is absolutely relevant. What do you think of the, the call nowadays, or the kind of urgent need expressed by the Chinese leadership to revisit Marxism. In principle, of course, that's a good thing. So studying him carefully is a very important thing. 
but um, I think that you, you, need to, you need to remember two things. Firstly, he never finished his work. The, the first volume of Capital is the only substantial book he ever published in his life. The other two volumes of Capital were compiled after he died from notes. And he had a plan for many more volumes. Originally, when he approached his publisher, he was going to publish something like 10 more volumes on all sorts of things, international trade, the role of the state, and so on. He never published any of them. And so we still have to fill in the gaps. And that's why the notebook, you know, all through his life, he wrote notebooks um, and many fundamental insights. But there may be two or three pages and then he passes on to something else. So we have a lot of work to do to complete his work. Let's talk about the kind of uh, um, implication of his theory in the present day world mm. and maybe in the world in, in the future. Uh, right now, it's all uh, characterized by the digital aspect of yes. things, right? And we are seeing a huge increase of corporate giants in the digital media, for instance, in the United States. Mm. We have Google, we have uh, Amazon, we have Facebook, Twitter, and in China, we also have very similar uh, phenomena, for instance, Baidu and Tencent. Yes. What do you think is the impact of digital media on cultural diversity and whether Marxism can provide some guidance in that respect? The digital media are, are, are even more concentrated than the, the old media. Um, I mean, it, it, six companies dominate Western media, uh, film, TV, newspapers, and so on. And th those are very familiar. Disney, uh, News Corp, uh, Viacom, and so on. When the internet came, remember, it, it was supposed to be uh, an open system. And everybody believed, or most people believed, that it would break the power of these big corporations. You have these big corporations at the top, and they're sending material down to audiences. Mm -hmm. Everybody believed the internet would be a flat system. Everybody would be able to participate. What came as a huge surprise to most people was that very soon, power over the popular internet became so concentrated. So you now have virtual monopolies in the West over key areas of people's popular use. And they have incredible control over what you can see on the screen. You take, uh, take um, Apple, for example. Apple will not allow anything onto an Apple machine that they have not approved. This is a new kind of censorship. This is a new kind of control. It's so what I, I describe for my students. It's the censorship of money. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very, very powerful. So we, we now have a digital media system that is more and more concentrated than we've ever had before. What is the benefit of that and what is the challenges of that? Well, the benefit is, is convenience. I mean, everybody says, oh, I can get everything on my phone. Mm -hmm. No, you can't get everything. The, the damage, Only the things that are allowed to come to you. Yes, the, the, it's a form of censorship. So the damage is what, what you never see. So take, take Facebook, for example, in, in Britain. Facebook now plays a major role in feeding news items onto people's Facebook pages. Yeah? It, from young people, it's the dominant source of their news. They're not watching programs like this. They're not reading the newspapers. They look on Facebook. What does Facebook put on there? It only puts the things that are relevant to that person as judged by their uh, previous postings. So you only get to read things you already agree with. And this is a disaster because you never see other points of view. So you just get confirmed in your own views. That's an incredible closure of the mind, but also of debate. Yeah, well, while he was compiling the uh, capital, he was talking, uh, Marx was talking about the role of machines yes. in the accumulation process. What do you think of the role of machine is in this internet age in connection well, to what we, you just we're said? Well, movi we're moving into a, new, a whole new er era, which you can only just glimpse, which is built around particularly robots and artificial intelligence. Uh, we're, we're moving into what's called the internet of things. So that people think of the internet, it, you and I, send at each other things. The Internet of Things is where you have intelligent devices, your refrigerator, everything in your house mm -hmm. has a computer capacity, and they communicate with each other, but also with the Internet, without your knowledge. Yes. 
but they're sending all kinds of information about you, what you like to eat, what you've got in your fridge and so on. So we're, we're, we've already moved into uh, a situation where the machines are talking more than the people. Um, and you have no control over that. Then when we come to robots, there's a, an estimation in the United States that in the next 15 years, robots will take 47% of all the current jobs that people do. Mm -hmm. Now, we have an enormous crisis. What are we going to do if that happens? Yeah. Uh, how will people live? And people are talking about the internet of everything, which exactly. is even uh, a step even further. But drawing from your research background, do you think Marxism or Marx would have come up with some kind of starting point for an answer to this? Well, Mar Marx, in one of his notebooks, Marx has a, a, an interesting discussion of this. But it dramatizes the problem. Mm -hmm. He says this could be wonderful because it would free people from doing very boring tasks and everybody could live a much fuller life if we were prepared to pay them not to work. But he also says, well, under current conditions, information and knowledge is owned by corporations. So it depends who gets the benefits of this uh, intellectual knowledge mm -hmm. um, that is inside the machine. Who will own the machine is yeah. really the big Basically big not the people whose jobs have been replaced by no, the no. robots, but the corporations. And, and that's a big problem. Yes, that, that we are seeing and people are trying to shift blames uh, for that by finding all kinds of excuses. But that gets to a different topic. Um, let's talk a little bit about your research area because you are known in the West or in China as a leader of the revitalization and development of critical political economy of media and communication. Uh, but there are many scholars who tend to isolate cultural studies with a political economy. Why do you want to bring the two together? Well, because that's the way the media are structured. The, the media are, are two things at the same time. They're, they're clearly an enormous industrial system. Enormous numbers of people are working in them. They make a lot of money. They're capitalist corporations like other corporations. But they have this one distinction, which is what they make is not something that you can buy or touch. That, or touch, it's, it's, it's our cultural world. They, they make the stories, they make the news, they make the symbolic world, the images that we all use mm -hmm. to try to understand ourselves and to understand the world. So for me, the really important question is, I, I'm very much in favor of having a cultural system which is diverse and, 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 and dynamic. So you ask yourself, what kind of economic organization of the media will help us to achieve that? Mm -hmm. Is it a good thing that only six companies control so much? Um, the answer for me is no, it isn't. Because that gives too much power to a very small number of people to decide what stories you will hear, uh, what uh, information you will, you will receive. So. For me, the two things cannot be separated. You, you, you have to think of the media as simultaneously both an economic yeah. system and a cultural system. But from the trends you are seeing, from the statistics you are seeing, are we heading even further in that direction? You just the more concentration of information and power yes. in, in smaller corporations? Yes, we are. And, and, that, 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 and, and that, that's the paradox of the internet, because the internet could be a system of participation. It could be a system for allowing more people to participate, but it's being closed. It's being closed down by these corporations. And for most people, they're very happy to just to have all of that on their phone. That's yes. all they want. Yes, and, unfortunately. And, <laughs> you know, so they, they, you know, they, they, are, they are not demanding to be you know, participating, um, except to uh, send selfie or something. Um, so we, we, we have a major problem. Uh, I think we have a culture that is closing in on itself much much more than before, actually. Yeah. And we in the media definitely have the primary responsibility th to think what to do and how to do it differently. Well, you also have the responsibility to offer s something that people cannot just get from yeah. the big, big companies, something different. Yeah. 